Welcome back to my channel, or if you're new, welcome. I'm gonna throw everything on the screen. You already know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that bell so you're notified every single time I post a video. Y'all, when I say I hoard videos, I am not joking. This video was filmed in January of 2020, right before my trip to Spain. Now, if you don't know what happened to me in Spain, check out this video here. I ain't gonna say nothing more. Luckily, this was one of the videos that was backed up to my computer before I left. However, in March of 2020, as you all very much know, the world ended up switching around in such a way <laughs> where it just didn't make sense to post an affordable travel video when there was a travel ban. So, you know, read the room. I read the room and the video just never went up. So yeah, this video is a gem, but just please keep in mind that it is an old video. So if any of the references or anything like that look slightly different on the actual website, that's why. Every time I post a travel picture on there, I get several DMs asking me how much the trip costed, how I afforded it, how did I budget for it. I got you. Again, to reiterate, this is how I, me, plan trips. This isn't the end all be all way to do things because obviously everyone's preferences are different. So I'll be explaining the three steps that I take to achieve an affordable trip. The first step is to create a loose budget. Second step is turning that loose budget into a fixed budget, which is the budget that I use on the trip. And the third step, which is the toughest step, is how to actually follow the budget. Because there's no point in creating this whole fancy schmancy budget if you're gonna go on the trip and blow all your money anyway. Okay, so we're talking loose budgets first. There are four things within that step that I'm going to cover. Flights, housing slash food, and you'll see why I put those two together in a moment. Activities slash transportation and buffer space. So I'm gonna explain to you guys in detail how I search for my flights. There are two mindsets that I could have when I'm searching and I'll go over each of them with you. The first one is if I have no clue of the destination. I know I wanna travel, but I have no idea where, when, I just wanna find something. The second mindset is if I know where I want to go, and even if I know when I want to go, but I just want to find prices that are good. So for either of these mindsets, I use the Google Flights feature for the initial stages of my searching process. Just to throw it out there, this is not sponsored. I feel like I said it like it was, it's not. I mean, Google, <clears throat> you can sponsor me if you want. But yeah, this is a, it's not sponsored. But yeah, Google Flights. I will say this works best on a desktop computer or a laptop. Their mobile version is, is a little glitchy and it freezes and it, don't, it doesn't work that well, FYI. So I'll move over and pull it up on the screen. First thing I do, type in Google Flights. You'll see the page come up and I click on the large map and it'll take me to the flights feature. So with the flexible dates feature, Google will pick the cheapest flight to any destination within the next six months or within any specific month of your choice. You can also add a cutoff price and that will filter out any country or location that's out of your price range. From there, you can pick the destination that you like for the price that you like, and then click on it to see what time frame Google gives you. So from there, what I will do is look at the time frame that they give me, and if it's one that I like, then I'll use it but if it's not really the time frame that I want, I'll use the calendar feature to kind of tweak the time frame and see what dates work for the price that I like. Usually in the calendar feature, it will highlight the cheapest time frames within that month that you're looking at. So I'll usually like to kind of go off of that date but sometimes that cheapest date might not work for your schedule. So pretty much just play around with it and see what time frame works best for you. Now, if you're dead set on a specific time frame, but you have no idea where you wanna go, you can also use those same features to put in that specific time frame that you want, and then from there, use the maps to see what countries pop up for the cheapest price within that time frame that you gave. Now, the second mindset is if you know where you wanna go, you just don't know when. For this one, I don't use the maps feature, I just go into Google Flights, and I type in from my airport to the destination airport. And from there, I'll just use the calendar feature and play around with whatever timeframes look cheapest. I have three quick tips. 
First, always, always search for your flights in incognito mode. I don't know if these myths are true or not, but people say that these airline websites can kind of track who's searching for one flight, and if someone keeps searching for the same flight over and over, then that flight price will increase. I don't, just to play it safe, search for all your flights in incognito mode. Second tip is to check to see if it's cheaper to depart from a different airport. I know, for example, that it's cheaper to take a bus to Boston and fly internationally from Boston than it is to try to find some type of flight from New York or Jersey or something. I will say though, sometimes the cheapest option isn't always the best option. For example, if you find something really cheap, but it takes 10 to 12 hours away from your trip and it's added to your travel time, it might not be worth it. Just keep that in mind also. The third tip is to write everything down. I know people will look at tons of different flights and kind of get lost in searching at all the different flights and different options. And if you're not writing everything down, it's kind of like, what's the point? You might forget what the cheapest flight was, what flight had the best duration compared to whatever flight you're currently looking at. So just to be safe, just write it all down so that you can easily compare your options. So at this point, you've decided on your top few destinations, or maybe you decided on one destination but have a couple of time periods in mind or just one destination, one time period. After you've done that, search for the same flights, same time periods through other third-party search engines. I personally have never used Google Flights to make a purchase. I only use it for the initial searching for time periods and then I use other websites to actually make my purchases. Although Google Flights is helpful because they won't just tell you a flight and a price. They'll tell you what airline it is and all that. So it makes it easier to search when it comes time to looking for other websites. I'll just throw out a couple that I use, cheaptickets.com. I purchase through that site a lot whenever I'm flying to LA or something like that. I haven't used it internationally yet, usually only for domestic flights. So far, Expedia.com has been the site that I used for my international flights. I use that for both Dubai and Bali. But a couple of sites to also look into, there's Cheapo Air, there's Kayak. So once you've gotten through searching through those third-party websites, seeing what deals you like, compare them to Google Flights, see if they're the same, see if they're cheaper. After you've done that, go to the actual flights website last. So for example, if Cheapo Air shows me a certain flight at a certain time, let's say Delta, I'll go to delta.com and I'll type in that exact flight information and see what price Delta shows me. If the price is more expensive on Delta, then I'll just buy it through the third party site. But if the prices are the same, sometimes with Delta, the prices are usually the same. So I'll just buy it through delta.com. And I will say also, make sure you're creating accounts with all of these airline sites because with Delta, for example, I accumulate mileage and you get points. And then when you get points, you get benefits. I know one time one of my flights got upgraded. Now, the reason why I say to look into the third party sites before you look at the actual airline website is because it gives you the advantage of being able to compare multiple airlines to each other. It's just a little better than, you know, just looking at all JetBlue flights and then all Delta flights and then all Emirates, you know. It makes comparing a little simpler and it prevents you from, you know, forgetting an entire airline altogether. Because if you don't know about an airline, you're not going to know to go on their website to search for it. But a third party site might pull up that airline and now you have options you didn't even think to consider. Four, you know and the very last tip for flights make sure you're paying attention to what these flights are offering some of the flights might look cheap but it's because baggage isn't included or foods not included you know look into what you get on this flight do you have to pay for your check bag do you pay for a carry-on is food complimentary those are the three questions that I always look into for a flight especially if the flight is over six seven hours am I eating for free because if not that's a problem Housing and food. We're gonna start with housing. Doesn't matter where I'm going, Airbnb is always the first website that I look at when it comes to looking for housing. For me, the features that I absolutely must have are entire place to myself. I'm not sharing with nobody. Wi-Fi included, because international data fees are no joke. And then I'll look at the different costs of places depending on if it has a kitchen or at the very least just a microwave and a fridge but I prefer kitchen. After I've done that, then I'll go on to Expedia or a website similar to that and I'll look at some flight bundle deals because sometimes 
they'll offer you a flight and hotel for cheaper than if you bought a flight and then an Airbnb separately. Now I will say most affordable hotel rooms don't include full kitchens and a lot of times Airbnbs will have full kitchens so that's one thing you have to consider. But sometimes hotels will have things like free breakfast and a pool. Although Airbnb has been stepping their game up a lot. So far all of my Airbnbs have been top notch. Pool, full kitchen, you know, my Airbnb in Dubai had a grocery market on the first floor, 24 hours. Okay, so now food. So I group food with housing because my plan and budget for food will depend solely on if I got an Airbnb with a kitchen, without a kitchen, if I got a hotel room, something like that. So if you ended up getting a room with a kitchen, plan to cook at least one meal a day for the duration of your trip. What I personally like to do is cook one really big meal at the start of my trip, and then that's what I'll kind of heat up and eat later throughout the trip so that I don't have to physically cook every single day while I'm there. You'll see in the Dubai vlog, for example, that I cooked like a really big baked mac and cheese for my friend and I, and then we ate that kind of periodically throughout the trip. We also ate like muffins and milk for one breakfast, you know? So it just helps reduce your cost of food. Now, if you're getting a room that doesn't have a kitchen, then in the planning process, look at the restaurants around your hotel room or wherever you are in the general area. So you don't have to get super specific and look at exactly what meals you're gonna order or anything like that, but just look at the general price range of that restaurant. So of the places you looked at, pick one meal from one of the more expensive places you looked at, take that price and round it up to the nearest 10 or add $5, whichever one amounts to more. And take that number and multiply it by the number of times that you would typically eat a day while you're on a trip. And then take that number and multiply it by the number of days that your trip is. When creating a loose budget, always round up and make your numbers really big. And when I move on to talking about fixed budgets, I'm going to revisit all of these categories and show you how I kind of trim it down to an affordable price. So activities, transportation. So I'm gonna cover how I plan for activities while I'm on a trip or how I don't plan for them for that matter. Me personally, I like to plan just one thing to do each day. The reason why I like to plan at least one activity a day is because it not only adds a little bit of structure to my trip, but then leaves the rest of the day for me to just explore and see what's out there while I'm out. But it also helps with budgeting because by thinking of one thing I want to do per day, it allows me to kind of see how much each of those things will cost. Some activities might be free and some might cost some money. And then from there, I'll take those numbers and double them. After I double them, I'll round them up to the nearest 10 or I'll add $5 and then add them all up together. And that'll be my excursions budget. Now you don't have to get all super specific about what day you're gonna do what activity unless the activity you're paying for makes you select a day and time. I'll look at Airbnb experiences or I'll go onto specific websites to search for you know any activities that I want to do. Typically, not always, but a lot of the times, these type of activities that you find online will be prepaid, like Airbnb experiences, for example. So it's nice because when I'm on the trip, it'll feel like I'm not paying for anything because it had already been paid for a month ago. But usually the only thing you're paying for is maybe a tip or something like that. If you're someone who prefers to wing it all entirely and just kind of go and see what you find, I'd say think of just the most expensive activity that there is to do out there, take that price, multiply it by two, take that number and multiply it by the number of days of your trip. So the next thing I consider is the cost of transportation to and from whatever it is I'm doing. What I like to do is kind of go online and I'll calculate the cost of a car ride from my Airbnb to the furthest activity on the map that I plan to do. I take the cost of that ride and multiply it by two, because you gotta drive home, and then I take that number, multiply it by maybe three, assuming that I do three back and forth trips a day, which I know I won't, but you just want a large loose budget number for starts. And I take that number and multiply it by the number of days of my trip. Lastly is the buffer. I always make it a point to include buffer money in the planning of my trip. So I always look into the cost of how much it would be if I miss my flight, for example. And I will say a lot of times if you miss your flight, you don't have to pay anything. What the airline will do is just kind of put you to the side. And if the next flight has a space, then you can just hop on. And if they don't, then you might have to pay something. I don't know. But 
Just worst case scenario, take into account what it might cost you if you miss your flight. Aside from that, all of the rounding up that we've been doing in those previous categories kind of count as the buffer space, so you should be okay. Lastly, I'll take that final cost that you're looking at. It's probably a really big number, but that's okay. Take that number and round it up to the nearest 50, and that's your loose budget. The number might look a little crazy, but it's okay. Crazy